Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to, to Glasgow. My name is Kenneth Kalman, and as a Deputy Lieutenant in the City of Glasgow, I speak for the Lord Provost in welcoming you here and hope that this conference is a success. I'm also a Chancellor at the University of Glasgow, and the University sends its good wishes to you too. Uh, you'll see it up on the hill uh, from the, uh, uh, the Congress here. Uh, it's got uh, some very nice scaffolding over the tower, so it's, it's not quite as beautiful as it usually is, but welcome from the University of Glasgow. This part of town is important. It's right on the banks of the River Clyde. 20% of all ships built in the early 1900s came from here in Glasgow, across the world. And the other thing you'll see is a very large crane outside. Just in the north of the city, we made steam engines. They were brought here, uh, put onto this crane, and dumped onto ships who went across the world to s celebrate uh, that. And the, it's been kept, thank heavens. Today, the weather is a very typical Glasgow day. <laughs> It's uh, very important also for me to be here today as I've had some interest in palliative care uh, over the centuries, it seems. Sam and I met at least 40 years ago, if not longer, uh, and uh, it's nice to be here and for me to be brought up to speed. This particular presentation by uh, Professor Clark is an important one. Uh, he works as part of the university down in the campus in Dumfries, a beautiful campus to work in, and his interests are wide-ranging across palliative care. He has a particular knowledge of the work and life of Dame Cicely Saunders and is editing her letters and selected publications and working on a new biography to be published in 2018. And indeed, I first met Dame Cicely probably in 1972. Uh, he's got lots of other things he, he's doing and writing, uh, but what he's going to do today is talk about global interventions at the end of life. Uh, and he's working with a good team, uh, as all these things have to be. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing from him tonight. David. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you, Sir Ken, for those words of introduction. I'd also like to thank the Congress uh, and the University of Glasgow uh, for helping to make this session possible. Um, and I'd also like to welcome some invited guests who come along uh, to join us uh, this evening for, for this lecture. Um, I, I think it was in 1992 that I, I first came with Sam to Glasgow um, for what was the second meeting of the Palliative Care Research Forum. There were 32 people there, and that was an improvement on the 17 that had met the previous year in Cardiff. Um, by 1995, we were having a meeting of the Palliative Care Research Forum and the Association of Palliative Medicine uh, at Durham University. Uh, Eduardo Bruera was one of the speakers. And over the dinner, uh, a plan was cooked up to bring together the... Um, PCRF as it then was, the APM, and also the Palliative Care Nursing Association. And they would all work together to uh, produce something called the annual palliati or the Palliative Care Congress, uh, which has gone on from there, uh, I think, every two years, um, this being the 11th. So some of its history certainly goes back to Glasgow in the early uh, 1990s. Preparing for tonight, I, I was thinking back over those years uh, and thinking uh, a little bit about my own uh, particular areas of interest that I've been able to pursue uh, in that time. Uh, I have to say some of them very much encouraged by Sam uh, in the early days, uh, really focusing on four themes that have interested me, uh, policy and evaluation and increasing the implementation of uh, hospice and palliative care programs. Uh, work around the global development uh, of palliative care and the attempts to map and, and to some extent rank that development. Uh, I've also had a, an interest in the sociology and anthropology uh, of death and dying uh, in that time and, and a particular focus on the, the history of hospice, palliative care uh, and related movements. Um, 
In the last 18 months, I, I've been freed from uh, fascinating but onerous duties as the director of the University of Glasgow's Dumfries campus, uh, and I've had a chance to get back to some of this work uh, in earnest. Uh, most recently, been working with Scottish Government on the preparation of its strategic framework for action, which will uh, shape the direction of uh, palliative and end-of-life care over the next five years here in Scotland and also doing some particular studies locally uh, uh, on the um, situation of patients in hospital and their likelihood uh, of death within a year in Scotland. And this has been some work that um, has caused a lot of interest, uh, not only locally but, but further afield, where we've showed that in effect uh, now twice and in two separate studies that uh, on any given day in Scotland, um, one third of patients in hospital are in the last year of life. It's a great opportunity for some of this uh, advocacy and, and, and focus on end-of-life planning uh, to be taken up uh, if these patients can be identified. So this has been some of the work I've been doing focused around these different themes. Uh, I got these books out on my kitchen table a couple of days ago. I was slightly tired when I'd laid them all out and that some of them I'd forgotten about and probably you've forgotten about most of them. Um, this one's particularly important to me. I've just um, finished uh, this book. It's on the history of palliative medicine uh, from the 19th century, uh, essentially framing um, the uh, 100 years from 1887 when William Monk, uh, pictured here, published his book on easeful death called Euthanasia, uh, using that older meaning of that term. Um, from 1887 and William Monk to uh, 1987 and the creation of the palliative medicine specialty uh, in Britain. Uh, this is essentially the theme of this new book which uh, is coming out in uh, uh, October, September of this year. So all of these interests in a sense have shaped uh, where we've got to uh, with this new project, uh, Global Interventions at the End of Life. And uh, I know that some of you have been making notes and uh, wanting to take down details of this. Please don't refrain from that. Just enjoy the lecture because at the end, you're going to be given by members of uh, our team who I think are out there somewhere. Can they wave their hands? Yes, yeah, some of them there. That's right. Uh, you're going to be given a, a copy of this remarkable origami that we've produced, especially for you, that captures the whole uh, of this lecture just in a, a few small sheets of paper. So... Make sure you go home with one of these. So Global Interventions at the End of Life, it's a study funded uh, by the Wellcome Trust under its uh, welcome, uh, uh, investigator scheme. I've been lucky enough to, to get a Wellcome Trust uh, investigator award. And it uh, is really exploring uh, these three major questions. Um, we're interested in why and how and uh, with what consequences a field of end-of-life care has emerged around the world uh, in recent decades. Um, we're particularly interested in how end-of-life interventions of various kinds uh, are being formulated and delivered in different settings and with different kinds of outcomes and implications. And what we're trying to do ultimately is to somehow get above this whole emergence of a, a global field um, and as social scientists frame the issue in perhaps some new ways, bring some new concepts and ideas uh, to the table that might over time lead to greater efficacy in this work uh, and also contribute to the sustainability uh, of uh, end-of-life care uh, programs and interventions in the future. Because as we uh, are going to see, the uh, demand for these kinds of interventions is going to grow very significantly uh, in the coming decades. So I'm lucky enough to have a great uh, team of colleagues to work with on this project. This was us just one year ago when um, our uh, group formed, um, first day of our study, the 1st of March uh, 2015. Um, on the left is uh, Shah Hadouz Zaman, who's a medically qualified me medical anthropologist with particular interest in global health, uh, originally from Bangladesh. Uh, then myself, then uh, Katrina Forrest, who um, is from uh, this part of the world, from Glasgow. Um, our public engagement officer, who uh, has been working with us from the beginning of the project, uh, looking at ways to engage wider audiences in the work that we're doing. 
using a variety of media, which I'll explore more later on. And then um, Hamilton Inbadas um, from Tamil Nadu, um, an ordained priest in the Church of South India, uh, trained in ethics and, and theology, uh, and working with us uh, on our team. So that was us a year ago, and uh, now we're, uh, we've expanded a little bit. We've been able to appoint uh, a new lecturer to work with us, Naomi Richards, who uh, is pictured in the middle at the top there. And also we've engaged uh, a lecturer in public health, a social scientist, Sandy Whitelaw, at the bottom there. Uh, both of these uh, people now working with us very closely uh, as our project unfolds. I thought it might be helpful to try and get some sense of the scale of the, uh, of the questions that we're trying to address by looking at this diagram that was produced uh, by the Wellcome Trust uh, a couple of years ago. And it was an attempt to um, uh, classify the, not just the numbers of people who died in the course of the whole of the 20th century, uh, but also the major causes of death. And you can see them outlined there in the, in the denser colors, uh, non-communicable diseases, uh, Death caused by um, human interventions of various kinds, uh, war and, and conflict and so on. Cancer, rather small, actually, um, uh, uh, figure in relation to the total and infectious disease, a massive number. My purpose here isn't to go through that in detail, but to raise a question that arises from it. Um, this figure of 5.5 billion people who died in the whole of the, the 20th century, as far as we are able to estimate, is in fact a figure which is lower than the current population of the world. I think this puts it, you might say, well, that's comparing an apple with an orange, but I think it gives us some sense uh, uh, of the scale of the issue when we're looking at human mortality and interventions at the end of life that we are going to face uh, in, in the coming decades. There are more people alive today in the world than died in the entire uh, 20th century. So this is something of the scale of the issue that we're trying to look at. We know at the moment that there are uh, something like 56 million deaths in, in the world uh, occurring every year. 85% um, of these in the developing countries. But most of the discussion about the manner of the, the deaths of those people and how they're cared for focuses on the 15% who die in the, in the richer parts of the world. There are sketchy estimates of what uh, these figures might turn into in the future, but we've seen an estimate that by 2050 there could be something like 90 million deaths occurring in the world uh, every, year, every year. This is a phenomenon associated uh, with global population growth that's driven not by an increase in uh, the birth rate, but rather the uh, increase in population that's driven by global aging. Um, it's not often recognized that the, the global birth rate has been declining since the early 1980s. It's not more children being born that is expanding the population of the world. It's all of us living longer, not just in the West, but in many other parts of the world as well. So there are many, many implications here for thinking about uh, end-of-life issues in this global context. And then within that, there are new and unpredictable challenges that result from new infectious diseases. We've seen the uh, impact in the 20th century of HIV and AIDS and multi-drug resistant TB. There are also now, as we're, we're living through at this moment, complex humanitarian emergencies, which are also adding to uh, the uh, figures of numbers of people dying in different circumstances uh, all around the world. And if you take that kind of 90 million figure and you do a, a quick calculus based on the number of people who are affected by the death of any one person, then we could be looking uh, by the second half of this century at some half a billion people each year who will experience the death of someone close to them, whatever the nice term is for that, someone important to them. It's such a touching and heartwarming phrase, isn't it? Um, so these are some of the trends and, and then the challenges that uh, flow from that. Um, we're concerned about the numbers growing, but we're also concerned about, if you like, the global preparedness for this. To what extent is the world, is global society, and all of the communities uh, within that society uh, engaged with the challenge that uh, lies ahead? Um, 
not only as um, in some communities people become more enabled to deal with uh, these situations, but recognizing also that in other places and other communities uh, they become more impoverished in their ability uh, to uh, respond to these questions. Um, part of the starting point for our project is that in this context, um, there is really no consensus around how we should die, the circumstances in which care should be del delivered, what is optimal uh, and what is desirable. We've seen from the previous presentation that in the country that ranks as having the best end of life care in the world, there is precious little evidence to support what is done and there is a, a lack of consensus about what should be done. We're trying to uh, un un uh, engage in those questions, not just in the context of England and NICE, but in, in the context of of global society. So we're asking questions uh, about the complexity of this, the scale of it, uh, and what the global future of dying is going to look like. And one of the questions that's in my mind as well in terms of the demographics is just as with the notion of peak oil, that point in the uh, history of the world when oil production reaches its maximum, or the concept of peak baby, that point in the history of the world where more children were born in a single year than ever before or subsequently uh, has occurred, which was in fact 1982. When will we reach something we might call peak dying? And what will be the consequences of that for global society when it occurs? We think that um, there is uh, a need in looking at these questions Yes, to gather more evidence, uh, yes, to do more research and, and, and empirical inquiry, but perhaps much more importantly, uh, to bring together uh, to the uh, table new perspectives, new ways of thinking, and in particular, uh, new theoretical perspectives or, or other theoretical perspectives from elsewhere that might help us to somehow tease out the complexity of these questions and the responses that we will need to make in the global context. And, these are just three of those perspectives that we've been using in the last year uh, in our own project to try and find some new ways into uh, these questions. Um, globalization is probably an obvious one to start with, that whole notion of uh, globalization as a, a stretching process in which individuals of different uh, backgrounds and cultures interact with each other in new ways uh, across spheres of life and perhaps more intensively before uh, in the history, in, at any point in our history. Much of this fed by social media, but also by uh, uh, global and international travel uh, and, and uh, the flows of, of labor and, and, and uh, markets and skills and so on. Um, there's a lot of debate about globalization. There are those who praise it for its benefits and, and, and the, uh, uh, the sense of progress that it begin, b brings to the world. There are others, of course, who are very critical of the forces of globalization that um, are seen as being exploitive of uh, the most poor and vulnerable people in society, are seen as arms of more imperialist approaches to um, uh, global governance. The whole idea of globalization, I think, has forced us to stop thinking about um, national character as somehow the defining principle of how we make sense of uh, uh, peoples of uh, different jurisdictions and countries, and has turned our attention much more to issues about identity, about gender, about the politics of these things, about ethnicity, uh, and within that we see the role of um, cultural champions of religious and other kinds of new uh, social movements playing a very strong part in the way in which um, the uh, sense of globalization uh, affecting uh, us at a very personal and individual level is, is, is being played out. So inevitably we have to, in thinking about the global challenges of end-of-life care, we think we need to look at these theories and ideas about globalization to see to what extent we can use these to make sense of, uh, of, of what's being observed and ask the question, are, are we encountering a kind of globalization of dying? And would, if, if that is the case, uh, is that something to be celebrated? Is it something positive? Or does it contain inherent risks and problems uh, and difficulties uh, as a social process? Linked to that, there are, uh, there's a, a developing field um, in policy studies known as policy transfer. It's sometimes referred to as policy mobilities. 
Essentially, it's asking the question, what happens when you, you take one policy intervention or, or approach uh, developed in a particular setting uh, and seek to implement it somewhere else in order to achieve similar goals? And um, this uh, whole idea of transferring ideas, uh, 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 policies and, and strategies uh, from one location to another, I, we think is very, very relevant to uh, an understanding of the global development of uh, end-of-life care, palliative care in particular, uh, uh, ideas of, uh, for coming from hospice. We often read in the uh, international palliative care literature uh, about the importance of finding models that work and then rolling them out internationally and globally. Um, the policy transfer literature, the frame that you get when you start to use globalization as a theme to look at these issues, um, really starts to uh, question uh, the value of that approach uh, and uh, the wisdom of seeking uh, with enthusiasm uh, and passion to roll out things that have worked in one place or, as we've seen with the Liverpool Care Pathway, haven't worked in one place uh, to other settings. I'll come on to this later, but we're interested in our study in the Liverpool Care Pathway, not so much uh, for an understanding of what went wrong in Britain, though I think that is badly needed and is yet to be done. But uh, I think our focus will be on the 20 or more countries to which the Liverpool Care Pathway was rolled out in this language uh, and about which there has so far, as far as I'm aware, please correct me if this isn't the case, uh, been any commentary. So, that, you know, we are dealing here with a, a, a kind of global set of challenges around the ways in which policies, strategies, uh, innovations uh, roll out and transfer from one location to another. And we think this is a very uh, fruitful line of inquiry for us. But perhaps the most exciting for me intellectually of uh, the approaches that we've been exploring um, came very much from Zaman's uh, uh, ideas and thinking. Draws on uh, the work of Dipre Dipesh Chakrabarti, um, very notable uh, Bengali scholar who's working in the field of post-colonial studies sometimes referred to as subaltern studies. And um, we've learned about this uh, from uh, Zaman and he's learned about it from Dipesh himself, uh, is in regular contact with. Um, and it's captured, I think, in this wonderful metaphor, this notion of the waiting room of history. What are we talking about here? Well, what uh, Dipesh is really saying is that the underlying assumption that exists um, in the uh, global context of making comparisons between the rich world and the poor world or the developing and the developed world is that somehow the developing world is in a process of catching up with what, what has already been achieved uh, elsewhere. And he describes this as a narrative of transition that all developing countries are seeking to uh, uh, pass through. And it's one in which the archetype of what is to be achieved is de defined in terms of European values and the values of the, uh, of the Enlightenment. These are the archetypes that uh, other uh, less developed nations are seeking to arrive at. And this could be um, democracy, it could be prosperity, it could be um, uh, universal suffrage, a whole range of ideas that... Um, uh, promulgated within the European Enlightenment uh, project, which um, others now are uh, seeking to uh, achieve and are in the waiting room of history, uh, uh, waiting for this to happen. In that narrative, therefore, the situation uh, of the developing world and low- and middle-income countries, where, as you'll remember, 85% of all the world's deaths takes place, is one that's characterized by uh, concepts of lack, of absence, of incompleteness. Of, you, you'll often hear it at palliative care meetings, and I've certainly heard it when you say to somebody or you hear it said, um, do you have opioid availability in your country? And the person says, not yet. So it's this notion that we have yet to arrive somewhere that you have already arrived at. Now, we think that this is very, very fruitful uh, uh, terrain for exploring attempts to globalize uh, specialist palliative care uh, and the uh, beliefs, ideologies, practices that exist within uh, the palliative care movement into settings around the world. 
And what really Chakrabarti is, is pointing to here is that the relationship of transfer uh, is one that needs to be seen uh, in this kind of light, uh, but needs to be added to with the concept of translation. What happens when these ideas from the European archetype transfer, they're also translated in the process. They're changed in the process. And there is the potential for those ideas to come back to travel in the opposite direction. And these are some of the themes that we're, we're trying to uh, explore in our work. And what we've decided to do is to focus down on interventions uh, in order to do this. We're asking how end-of-life interventions are developed, implemented, assessed, uh, and with what consequences. We're doing this globally, and in particular what we're trying to do is to build a typology of interventions. Now you'll see in a moment that this typology is very comprehensive. It's not just about things to do with care. It's uh, an attempt to look at all of the ways in which as human beings in different societies and contexts, we make responses in an organized way to uh, end of life issues. So we're trying to build a typology of interventions, typology or taxonomy, and then what we're trying to do within that is to select interesting examples for more in-depth review and, and, and reflection. So our definition of an intervention is currently, and this is a work in progress, interventions are organized, in our terms, organized responses to end-of-life issues. And by, we're using that term organized quite carefully because, we, we, as you'll see, in a moment it can be organized in a very strong sense in the terms of uh, something that's recognized in law or in policy or in some kind of mandate. But we're also interested in it in a, a kind of softer or weaker sense where we're referring to something that's organized in the sense that it's part of a framework of belief or action which might be quite individual or personal or local uh, in character. We're trying to see interventions very, very broadly uh, in, in this way. And what we'd, we'd, we've decided to do is to look at two dimensions of these end-of-life interventions, and we call this the focus and the locus. What we mean by the focus of interventions is the character of something, some organized response to an end-of-life issue. Um, so this is about... Um, defining the elements that are within the intervention, seen as a kind of um, set of objects to which it's addressed and, and the purpose of intervening. We're trying to conceptualize our language here about the content, the orientation, the qualities of the intervention. It can include the, the goals, the ambitions uh, of those who construct and deploy the intervention. Uh, it can involve the, an exploration of its um, culture, its character, its makeup. Listening to the story of the Liverpool Care Pathway, you, you can't but help uh, acknowledge the importance of those kinds of dimensions in making sense of what happened when the Liverpool Care Pathway, as an end-of-life intervention, uh, was introduced. But we feel that those uh, dimensions of the focus are often overlooked. Um, we go straight to evidence of efficacy, but we don't properly tease out some of these other more subtle uh, and uh, dynamic uh, characteristics of the intervention. We add to that the locus, and by this we mean the geographical scope and spread of the intervention. Uh, so we're particularly interested in our study in interventions that move around uh, between different jurisdictions, different parts of the world, or different settings. And we're especially interested in the way in which the focus of an intervention might change uh, when the locus is also changed. So we're talking about locus and focus. We're also talking about transfer and translation. Tony Walter, the sociologist, once told me, people can't make sense of anything more than a box with those four things in it, two, you know, four boxes. So we, we're trying to limit uh, uh, our uh, conceptualization here a little bit to locus and focus, transfer and translation. Um, but we, we, um, we had to disappoint Tony a little bit when we came up with the 10 categories of intervention. I, I, I have to say I struggle to remember them all uh, myself. But 
This has been the product of a lot of searching and discussion and reading and uh, debate between us, uh, where we've tried now to identify 10, uh, well, we didn't try to identify 10, it came out as 10. Uh, we tried to ad identify a comprehensive range of categories that you could use to describe organized responses to end of life uh, issues, interventions of some kind. Um, some of these are very obvious uh, in, in character. They, they relate to particular types of clinical intervention or, or to particular sorts of services. Um, they relate to specific policies uh, uh, around uh, end of life care. But we've also added in other things. We think education, for example, is an intervention. We think research itself is an intervention. And we need to be more reflexive in, in our thinking about the role that research plays in not only understanding the world, but also in, in changing it. And we've also started to identify some kinds of interventions that may not immediately appear as interventions. And, I was partly being challenged by the Wellcome Trust when I was in the process of applying for this grant. Part of the process involved uh, an interview, and I remember being asked by a social anthropologist, when is an, uh, an intervention not an intervention? What would you define out of, of being an intervention? And so we, we started to think about, a, for example, here in the bottom right category, self-determined interventions, um, things that uh, individuals uh, might... Um, engage in uh, actions, decisions, choices made by individuals uh, to engage in or indeed to refrain from uh, something that has implications for them at the end of their life or the end of the life of another. So just to give that a little more detailing, self-determined interventions could include, but wouldn't be limited to, uh, the voluntary refusal of food and fluids, uh, rational suicide, assisting a suicide, mercy killing. We're also um, inspired by our colleagues in the um, University of Navarra, the uh, Atlantis project led by uh, Professor Carlos Centeno. They've got a theme running around the intangibles of palliative care. And we, we rather like this notion. Are there intangible interventions that uh, we could identify which um, promote and recognize the significance of aspects of human existence uh, that have intrinsic value at the end of life. They might be intangible in, in, in character, but uh, very, very important. Issues to do, perhaps, with spiritual care, opportunities to explore meanings, beliefs, values, attitude formation, the uh, ideas that exist around notions of dignity or compassion. These would be interventions that uh, we, would, we would put in this uh, intangible uh, category. So this is our emerging um, taxonomy or, or typology uh, of interventions, and we will be going to be doing more work to define these. And we believe that this at the moment, and please tell us if you think it's not, uh, is, is a comprehensive um, uh, laying out of the whole range of possible end-of-life uh, interventions. Uh, and we want to link that uh, more historically to the broader emergence of the end-of-life field in the global context. We think this is one way of studying the uh, emergence of the field to uh, lay out this uh, taxonomy uh, typology of, of interventions. From that, we want to and are um, studying some of them in more detail. There are many, many more interventions. Uh, I, I started out thinking that we could somehow make a catalogue of these interventions under all these categories. I don't think we can. That would be a kind of an encyclopedia uh, of interventions. But we are building up a good working knowledge of many, many examples of these uh, interventions of these different types around the world. But where we look at them in more detail, we're trying to use a kind of case study method some of our case studies are going to be, and are, desk-based, uh, perhaps uh, fairly uh, straightforward to, to manage and, and implement. Some of them we see running uh, throughout the lifetime of the project, uh, involving significant amounts of fieldwork and primary data collection. So there'll be case studies of different scales. But wherever we're engaged in that process of looking in more depth at an intervention, we're trying to do it using these three uh, dimensions. At what level is the intervention conceptualized? How is it being experienced by those who uh, provide or deliver it uh, uh, or are somehow responsible for it? Uh, and how is it experienced 
uh, by those to whom it's directed at the community level, at the individual level. Um, so working with that uh, kind of framework, we're, we're, we're beginning to pull out a number of um, uh, initial case studies that we want to explore in this kind of way. And I'll touch on a, just a few of these uh, tonight. But th these are the ones that are currently on our list. There are others as well. Uh, these are our biggest priorities. Some of them were mentioned in my original uh, grant application at the Wellcome Trust. Uh, others have arrived with us as we've uh, traveled over the last 12 months of, of working together. Keep returning to the Liverpool Care Pathway because it preceded this session, but it seems to me this is a wonderful example of something that is not properly understood and where the methods, the approach, the theoretical perspectives that we are wanting to uh, explore uh, and engage with might possibly tell us more than we have at the moment. We have at the moment many descriptions of what did or didn't work with the uh, Liverpool Care Pathway. We don't really have much in the way of an analysis that explains it. Uh, and we think that that's partly to do with the poverty of theory uh, surrounding these uh, descriptions uh, of the pathway. And that's a, um, a, a, an approach that we're bringing to other case studies as well. For example, uh, the neighborhood networks in palliative care is something we started off with a strong interest in. It's, it's emerging and developing into something rather broader than that, um, um, a theme around the importance of community more generally in the uh, delivery of end-of-life care. Um, but the neighborhood networks have attracted a huge amount of interest. There's quite a, a lot of literature on them. Uh, but in terms of the kind of formal criteria that um, Sam was laying out earlier about evidence of uh, efficacy and impact and so on, there is really remarkably little to be said about neighborhood networks. That, that therefore, isn't the end of the story for us. We're interested in why these, the Kerala model has been... Uh, so uh, successful in promulgating itself uh, in the south of India. But in particular, what we're interested in is what happens when that model is transferred to West Bengal or, or to uh, Bangladesh uh, or to Thailand or to Somalia. Uh, what is going on when the, the, the model uh, is moved around in that kind of way? How is it transferred and translated uh, in that process? Um, so these are some of the uh, studies that we're um, engaging in. The Death Cafe movement is something we're very interested in. It's kind of bubbled up even as we've been developing our work. Uh, why is that? Why are so many countries uh, now, uh, well, why is there evidence from so many countries that death cafes are, are happening there, that there's interest in them, that some kind of public discourse around them? better understand that, we decided to run some ourselves. And I, I have to say, at the personal level, I found the absolutely intriguing things to, uh, to be involved in. Um, but we're asking the question, why death cafes and what purpose do they serve and uh, why have they arrived at this moment and what might they contribute to these wider debates about end-of-life issues uh, in the global context? So these are uh, some of the, the case studies that um, we're working on. and. Uh, Zaman, uh, very keen to get out into the field, uh, has been working already in, in Kerala uh, and in West Bengal, and also in a, a related project in, uh, in Dhaka, which is uh, focused on providing a neighborhood network type of approach to some of the poorest people uh, in one of the slums of, of Dhaka in Bangladesh. With this study of the neighborhood networks, um, we come to another dimension that we're very, very keen where it's appropriate and valuable to do so, to work with other people on specific case studies. So we discovered not long after we began that Dr. Devi Vijay is actually a management behavioral scientist at the Institute of Management in uh, Calcutta, had written a PhD on the neighborhood networks. So, and uh, very quickly, we've been able to link with Devi uh, and Zaman, uh, you can just see Devi in the bottom uh, left of the picture there, uh, has been working very closely with her. Again, an, a, an example of bringing another set of questions and theories and, and perspectives from the management literature uh, I into uh, our, our own work uh, in order to try and get some different kind of purchase on it. Um, lovely quotes here from a, an interview that um, um, Zaman did recently. The, the neighborhood networks cut across caste, they cut, cut across class, they cut across political boundaries. They are um, a fascinating social phenomenon that's uh, 
being transferred and translated into different contexts. Uh, we want to better understand this as a social phenomenon and not simply be uh, confined to making an assessment of the neighborhood networks in terms of their clinical uh, efficacy or cost effectiveness. We're very interested in the role of public health in all this. I've been trying to trace this back a little bit in my new book and I, I think that the kind of notion of harnessing hospice as it then was primarily to public health thinking really gets going in the early 1980s and is crucially it gets going uh, in uh, with the appointment of Jan Sternsvard as the, uh, the chief of cancer at WHO in about 1982. Um, the original focus is on cancer pain, uh, how you bring a public health lens to that, which at the time seemed very counterintuitive. And very, very quickly, uh, palliative, uh, uh, WHO then started to get more involved in the uh, terrain of defining what palliative care is uh, and how it might be uh, promulgated around the world. The people who were active in the pain ladder work were, uh, in some cases, were some of the leaders in the emerging hospice uh, and palliative care field, notably Robert Twycross and others. This led to the WHO's famous foundation measures being defined, and from the late 1990s, you see it becoming very common to make appeals to the language of public health uh, when uh, talking about how palliative care's goals can be promulgated. We are asking which public health has been referred to here, and I've written a blog about this a little while ago, having been at the Copenhagen uh, EAPC conference, uh, where there was a lot of rhetoric about uh, we, need to make, we need to have a public health approach to palliative care implementation. But of course, when you start to scratch below the surface of that, and particularly if you work with people who know something about the history of public health, uh, you realize that public health is in many ways just as ill-defined, just as much a disputed space as is palliative care itself. So I found it really interesting that palliative care, which uh, often can be seen not knowing where its boundaries begin and end, uh, not knowing what its definition is, I mean, it's a huge attempt in the United States to redefine palliative care in a way that uh, the founders of the hospice movement in Britain would barely recognize. Um, a disputed space around palliative care, its definition and boundaries, oh, well, we'll get out of this, let's say, mess by harnessing to public health. And then you look at public health, you find there's no definition of it that's agreed. There's huge dispute about the new public health and the old public health, uh, whether it's an epidemiological or a political model, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really interested in this and uh, trying to explore that in particular through the tra trajectory of uh, WHO from the 1980s uh, as the, a chief uh, agent in the introduction of public health into the discourse of palliative care. And this led us to a little study which we, we've um, just completed, uh, and in fact, we just submitted it to a journal yesterday, where we s were sitting around thinking about one aspect of this public health approach, and we were thinking about uh, one of our categories of intervention, which is advocacy, and we were looking and thinking about these palliative care declarations, in particularly the 2014 declaration from the World Health Assembly, um, which came out of that global atlas of palliative care and called on all governments to engage in uh, the delivery and in, uh, integration of palliative care into their uh, national health strategies. So we've done a piece of work here. It's been, it's been particularly Hamilton that's been leading on it. He's done some diligent work uh, digging around and, and searching uh, for declarations that relate to palliative care. And we're going to go on from this to look at other declarations that relate to assisted dying, to end of life issues for older people, uh, and also pain. But we started with palliative care, kind of low hanging fruit, uh, uh, mapping the rise and the spread and the contents and the purpose of uh, uh, palliative care declarations. Uh, this slide is already slightly out of date. We, we, uh, after it was completed, we, uh, Hamilton found a fourth one uh, I, I told Phil Larkin on the telephone yesterday, the president of the EAPC, I said, did you know how many palliative care declarations there are, Phil? And he said, I have no idea. And I said, well, we found 34 of them. And he said, well, it makes you wonder whether we need another one. So whether there's going to be one in Dublin uh, in June when the EAPC meet, well, you watch that space. But there is something going on. Why, why these uh, declarations? What do they consist of? 
We see a trickle of them in the early 80s. More recently, there's been a, a, a small flood of them uh, occurring in different places. And Hamilton's looked at um, what, what their purpose is, what they're setting out to achieve, what's in them, uh, the kinds of uh, recommendations they make, the ways in which they engage in a call to action to others. Uh, they're, they're, and again, for us, they are data in the sense that they provide another way, another lens for making sense of the history of end-of-life care globally. It's a different way of making sense of the emergence of a field is to explore these declarations uh, and their content and, and their geographic scope. Very interesting that um, 16 of them are global. Uh, there are some very regional ones from Canada and Kerala. I didn't know that I live in uh, the UK that there were three declarations uh, from the related to England that were uh, explicitly linked to general elections that were produced by the National Council. Um, and we see the relatively small numbers uh, of declarations appearing uh, in huge countries like India and China. And um, we noted there were no declarations in palliative care from the United States of America. So it's telling you something about the character of the field, what's important to it. And in, in, down the right-hand side, uh, Hamilton's been able to identify some of the strongest themes that emerge uh, uh, in these declarations, issues to do with... Uh, uh, education, policy, uh, the provision of, uh, of, of uh, drugs and pain relieving uh, uh, medications and so on. They give you a very rich and, and detailed picture of what is on the mind of the palliative care world at any given point uh, over the last few decades and how those, uh, uh, what is on the mind of those people is being translated into some kind of declaration or set of commitments or, or call to action. So where are we now uh, with our study? Um, one year in, I think we've made quite good progress. Um, the beauty of the Wellcome Trust um, as a funder is they don't give you or ask you to produce, in my case, a 48-month Gantt chart where every month you will know exactly what you're going to have for breakfast and what you'll be doing. Um, what they give you, and I think, Welcome is very unusual in this, in its uh, uh, humanities and uh, uh, ethics and society programs, is the license to think more freely, to perhaps provoke the field that you're interested in a little bit, uh, to think outside of the box, try to draw in ideas and concepts from elsewhere, and to be on a journey uh, of discovery and exp exploration. And I feel that's what we're, where we are with our work. Um, at the moment, we're working on a number of concepts papers around the waiting room of history, around public health and palliative care, the taxonomy of interventions, the definition. Um, we've also made a bit of traction with the, with the case studies, and uh, the, in the case of the declarations one, we've now um, been able to finalize an analysis and write up a paper, but we have other uh, case studies uh, around death cafes, self-directed uh, interventions. The integral model of palliative care, so-called, in, in Belgium, where you have uh, legalized euthanasia and palliative care sitting side by side and sometimes practiced integrally within the same services, um, often um, uh, dismissed uh, by palliative care commentators, still very poorly understood, very marginalized in, in the discourse. I was writing about it recently in, in, on our blog. Uh, in relation to the new EAPC paper on euthanasia. I think that could be a very, very important uh, um, area for, for study for us. Building on our academic partnerships with colleagues in other universities around the world. And in particular, and I just want to close on this, promoting wider public engagement of our work because we saw from the, that slide of the team that we had a public engagement person with us on day one with, in Katrina. Um, when I was writing the grant application, in, originally that post went in for year four only. And then I began to think, well, why would we do that? Wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be more interesting, more challenging uh, to build in public engagement with the work from the very beginning and through the process uh, of doing our study? Um, so that's what we've tried to do. It, it presents all sorts of fascinating opportunities uh, and, and ways to... Um, discuss and, 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 and share our ideas and, and engage with a, a variety of media in order to do that. So we have a website, well everyone has a website. Um, we started a blog a whole year before our project started, which um, 
by uh, month one of the project, March of last year, uh, had already created a kind of community of interest in, in, in the work that we were doing. Uh, I think we've now got nearly 100 posts on that blog. We have a lot of people reading it and engaging with it in various ways. Um, we've been very active in the social media. Maybe not so active as, uh, what do you call them, Sam? The, the Lego palliateurs, they seem to be quite uh, active and we're, we're tweeting away as well and uh, following them a little bit. Um, video, we've got a number of films and uh, films of lectures and, and, and uh, talks and interviews and things uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, podcasting, doing the same thing. Um, one, one thing that we were very pleased with that we, we uh, put on the channel to mark the 10th anniversary of Dame Cicely's death was a, an interview I did with her just about a month before she died, an excerpt from that. Um, things that we're trying to add to the field, to uh, be a resource, to be a point of contact, but to get beyond the field as well. To, to, it's really heartening when you get responses to this that uh, are coming from people who aren't inside the field. So that's part of the goal of the public engagement. And also organizing a number of events. I mentioned the death cafes. This was a death campfire that we had uh, uh, at the end of August in uh, the beautiful region of Dumfries and Galloway where our project's located. Uh, and the death campfire took place in uh, the context of an environmental arts festival. It was off grid for a whole weekend with a whole series of events taking place in a, a remote rural location. Trying to find different audiences, different groups, communities of interest to engage with in discussions about end of life issues uh, and interventions. These are some of the key features of the, uh, the public engagement uh, approach. I just want to conclude with the teamwork culture. I, I, I hope you don't think I'm romanticizing or being a bit cheesy here, but I think somehow it's been very important to us as a group of people to find a way of working together that respects the values of our funder uh, in terms of openness and respect and um, uh, commitment um, and, and to demonstrate those values in the way that our team works. So we've fostered partly intentionally, partly uh, unintentionally, uh, a, a sense of respect and kindness between our colleagues. We, we, we meet together regularly. One of the things we like to do each month, uh, instead of having a kind of staff meeting, we have something called a curated meeting, where one member of the team takes responsibility for the event for a couple of hours. It's usually held somewhere away from the university. So this one we call Coffee and Chakrabarti. This is when Zaman introduced us to the work of Dipesh Chakrabarti some months ago in a cafe in uh, Dumfries, but we've held events, uh, uh, these curated meetings in, in, in other kinds of places as well. Trying to find a way to generate um, a culture within our team that will allow ideas and, and, uh, and, and new concepts to, to prosper uh, in our work. So I'd, I'd like to conclude um, with where we were a year ago exactly. I was speaking at the um, American Hospice and Palliative Medicine Academy annual conference in Philadelphia almost exactly a year ago today uh, about my work on the project on death in America. And um, I showed this short film that we'd made in advance of the start of our project. And on reviewing it again one year later, I think we still feel fairly confident that this film captures what our study's about and where we're trying to go. So thank you very much for listening. We can have a bit of a discussion uh, uh, in the room uh, before we all go, but we will be around for the networking opportunity that exists later on. I think that will involve um, the uh, ingestion of flu fluids and food as well. Um, so if you want to talk to people in our team, that would be very nice. Talk to our guests. And please make sure you go away with the origami, which you will treasure and uh, probably will have framed on your wall before very long. So thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy this little film. It only lasts 90 seconds. Around the world, one million people die every week, yet less than 10% get suitable palliative and end-of-life care. Meanwhile, the need is growing. The global population is increasing and getting older. More deaths, more demands on families, communities and services. Palliative care is developing, but not at the scale we need. Governments, policymakers and funders are being asked to respond. A dignified death and freedom from pain can be seen as human rights. And public interest in how we die is increasing. 
but there is no consensus on how to achieve a good death. There is limited evidence on effective interventions and services for end-of-life care, and our commitment to act is not equal to the level and complexity of global need. New research at the University of Glasgow is looking at these important problems using pioneering methods to find sustainable solutions. How we care for people at the end of their lives is an issue that affects everyone. And led by Professor David Clark, the Glasgow team aims to redefine the debate, changing global policy and practice. Join the conversation at www.gla.ac.uk slash end of life studies. Well, thank you very much, David. <laughs> thank you very much indeed for, I think, a very different view of palliative care and dying, which is, I found fascinating and quite exciting. Uh, interestingly, the last slide or so, that the university logo's up there, and its motto is Viva Veritas Vita, the way, the truth, and the life, which is actually quite a nice one for palliative care, too. We've got time for a few questions. Any comments? Hands up, please. The only comment I had, uh, David, was you uh, talked about the developing world getting contributions and thoughts from the developed world. There must be another way around that in which the developing world gives us something important. That, that's the idea of transfer and translation. Um, that's why we want to look more carefully at um, what is already happening in the developing world in the low and middle income countries. I think that can sometimes be a rather trite statement, you know, that's often heard at palliative care conferences. Um, you, you will have heard this in India or Africa, usually from a European or American. You've got so much to teach us, and it always jars with me a little bit. But I think that is what we're trying to foster, this notion of transfer and translation, and, and trying better to understand what happens when ideas and concepts, interventions developed in one place move from one place to another. And that doesn't just have to be from the rich world to the poorer parts of the world. Any, any further comments? Yep, somebody here. There's one here. Uh, ben Ritson Tyler, I mean, uh, I'm a PIT medicine consultant. I'm particularly interested in workforce planning. And what you are, have said today is just open some uh, thought, is that you talked about the peaking of, uh, of um, the number of deaths in the world. Uh, you said 82 was the peaking for the birth. So where do you think the peak may be? Is it, do we add another 80 years or more? We, we don't know. And I, I've actually uh, had a bit of email correspondence with Danny Dawling, the geographer on this. I don't know if people here know Danny's work, but we're, we're very keen on it. Um, the, there can only be estimates. I mean, in the rich world, you estimate that 1% of the population dies annually. Um, but you have to take account also of um, natural disaster, of war, uh, of um, the potential for major disruptions uh, due to migration, problems of famine. Uh, it, it, it's hard to know, but I, I think that we probably will reach that point sometime in the next 30 to 40 years. But, uh, you know, it, it can only be, it's one of those things that can only be understood retrospectively. But uh, I, I'm just using it as a kind of concept to raise awareness in people's minds that uh, we are facing. I mean, another metaphor would be a tsunami of death and dying. And one of the questions we're asking is to what extent are we in our communities around the world aware that this is going to happen and what degree of preparedness exists? Because I think you'll have gathered it's implicit in our approach that workforce planning is an aspect of it. But much of the care, much of the response, much of the delivery is not going to be done by a workforce in the conventional sense of those who are trained and paid to do something. It's going to be delivered by uh, people in their own local contexts, in those people who are important to them, uh, their families, their neighbors, their, their, their wider communities. And that's one of the reasons we're very interested in the neighborhood networks and in the new public health approach, 
uh, what, what, what can be done to foster a greater sense of collective responsibility for these issues that lies beyond the responsibility of the workforce conventionally understood. Thank you, David. Uh, a masterful uh, sort of coverage of, of the well, global uh, themes. And uh, well, congratulations on the work you're doing. Uh, I'm really pleased that you decided to bring into your, into your sort of purview what you call integral palliative care. And that's in looking at the side-by-side the -side development of assisted dying and end-of-life care. And it's, it's absolutely right that th those things should be looked at together because we've had for a long time a kind of polarization as if the two couldn't exist in the same room. But interestingly, they go back to the exactly the same roots, the idea that people should be able to determine what happens to them in healthcare and also people should, we should be looking at individuals' needs. Um, and it's interesting that you know, we, when people say they want to have this or that is part of their end of life care, that's fine, it's on the agenda, it's on the menu. But when people talk about when they want to die, that's not on the agenda. So I'm really glad that you are putting these, this also onto your very important menu. Yeah, I, th I think it's a challenging area and it's not necessarily one that will make us or me popular with some colleagues in palliative care because as you've said, they, traditionally, historically, there's been this great opposition between those who favour assisted dying and the legalisation of euthanasia and those who promote palliative care. And it was often said that by promoting palliative care, you would obviate the need for uh, assisted dying. Um, I'm also very struck by the way in which the... There are only three countries in the world which have legalized euthanasia. Um, they're all in Europe, uh, and one of them is Belgium. And uh, that, in that country, there, uh, at least in Flanders, there is this integration going on. Um, it's deeply marginalized in the discourse uh, of palliative care and at meetings. It's one of the few occasions uh, I've ever seen somebody shouted down at the palliative care meeting when they talked about this. They, they even deigned to talk about it, and they were shouted down. This isn't the subject of a palliative care meeting. I think that is perhaps changing a bit. Nobody shouted yet. Um, so it will be a tricky one to do, uh, but we're interested in knowing just as much about the values and the motivations and the passions of those who see this as something that is appropriate and, and, and viable and sustainable. So it won't be an easy area to study, but I, I think it will be an important one. There's one comment here, and that will be our last comment. Oh, one there, two, two comments, two quick comments, please. Just to, pick, just to uh, pick up on the Belgian uh, example there, is there, do you notice any decrease in resistance within the palliative care movement to the, the, the other side, if you like, more controversial side? No, how, how is that measured? I mean, the decrease in resistance wouldn't be reflected in the new EAPC paper on the same which says that, palliative, uh, that assisted dying has no place within palliative care and that was the settled position at 11, 12 years ago and has been reiterated just in the journal of palliative medicine last month so that wouldn't be a very uh, good marker of uh, a change but I think there would be other ways to explore that and maybe we could try and look at that. Hello, thank you, David. Um, Sarah Russell from Hospice UK. Just very quickly, I was very interested in what you said about death cafes, and I wondered where you saw those fitting into palliative and hospice care providers. Are they something separate, or are they something public? What are your thoughts about death cafes? Sorry, I, I didn't quite catch that. The, the question was about the death cafes. Yeah, where they sit in with um, hospice and palliative care services. Is this something they should be doing, or is it a public-led, community-led initiative? Uh, I think for me, and I mean, I don't have any immediate claims to expertise on this other than the fact that we've been starting to look at them and we've run some ourselves. But there's again a kind of uh, issue around what is a death cafe and there is an organization that tries to define what it should be and, and it, within particular kinds of boundaries and we followed the, that in, in the events we've held. Um, they're absolutely not just about care. They can be about all sorts of other things to do with death and, and dying. Um, for me, the beauty of them is that they take place in cafes. Uh, you know, you take over a cafe for an evening, you have coffee and uh, cake, and uh, basically you can talk about anything you want to do with death, dying, and bereavement uh, in any way you want. 
I'm not so sure whether they, they would be helpfully done in other settings. Maybe they would. And I think sometimes they're being done at conferences like this. Um, we, we have found them quite extraordinary experiences. Uh, the willingness of people who are strangers to one another to spend a couple of hours talking about these issues. Uh, and often never mentioning medicine, nursing, hospice, palliative care at all in the space of two hours. Um, we, we, we found this quite intriguing. And um, as another kind of social movement bubbling up, I think it merits uh, better understanding. And they seem to be great fun to do. Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to thank David and his team for a fascinating talk.